All right, hello everybody. We had a little bit of a break there, but uh, I think we'll kick off. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining my talk. Today I'm gonna focus on uh, a story about migrating from EC2 to Kubernetes. And it's really, it's a, a series of lessons learned from a brownfield migration. And so I work for, um, for Octopus Deploy. Uh, my colleague Kale just told you a story about uh, some of our uh, inner workings, kind of our build and productivity. Um, but this was a significant project for us. And so I'd, I'm thrilled to uh, share it with you. So if you don't know me, no, my name is Rob Pearson. Uh, I'm a DevOps engineer at Octopus Deploy. We're a great Australian company. And I've been with the company since it was quite small. I joined in 2015. I've almost been there 10 years. Um, if you see, my contact details are there. There's uh, a QR code there. If you scan it, it'll take you to my LinkedIn. Again, similar to, that's the one social platform I tend to use. But feel free to, to add me. Um, the one thing I try to do, though, is I accept in, um, invites from people I speak to. So if you want, just come have a chat, and I'm happy to accept. And it'd be great to uh, chat from time to time. So today, what we're going to be look, well, talking about is a brownfield mi migration project. And the one that we're going to be talking about today is Octopus Cloud. So um, if you're not familiar with Octopus, I'll, I'll introduce it just briefly in a minute. But it's a cloud-hosted solution. And that's where we migrated from VMs, older solution, to the more modern platform, which is Kubernetes. And so I'm going to cover, well, I'll introduce the project and kind of the scope. And then I'm going to switch to six lessons learned. And the interesting there for me is that we have a lot of technical lessons learned from the project. But there's also some commercial lessons learned, the motivation of why we made the change and the benefits down the, down the road. And so we should also have some time at the very end just for questions. So um, yeah. And with that, we'll kick off. And I'm going to get started, and I'm going to talk about Octopus Cloud and that brownfield migration. So just quickly, again, this talk is not about Octopus Deploy as a product. Um, as my colleague mentioned in the talk previous, if you were here, we're focused on continuous delivery. We're, we're best of breed CD. And so we're uh, part of a, a CI CD pipeline. And we're focused on deployment automation and operations ta automated operations tasks as well with runbook automation. But if you, oh, first of all, just how many people have heard of Octopus? Just quick hands. Yeah, so we're an Australian company. Most people have heard of us. Uh, how many people are using it right now at work? So we got a handful again. So um, if there's one takeaway, just learning or like a knowledge of Octopus, when we started, we were deploying mod deployment automation for .NET developers. And it was deploying .NET web apps to virtual machines. Now we've expanded quite a bit. So we support Kubernetes, all major clouds, but new and old infrastructure. But beyond that, if you have any questions, if you want to chat about Octopus, feel free to chat with one of the people with a, an Octopus logo on their shirt. Um, the other thing I'll just mention quickly, just for anybody, we are hiring. So if you go to octopus.com, we have jobs available as well. So check that out if you're in the market. Now, the project we're going to be looking at today is Octopus Deploy. So when we started, we're over 10 years old now. We, we were installed on on-prem. Uh, everyone had virtual machines. Typically, you had you build servers or CI servers and any other infrastructure. Everything's on-prem. And we were an application the teams had in a virtual machine and deployed to virtual machines at that time, back, back in 2012. But as the industry kind of evolved and technology changed, platforms changed, we sh really, we, were, we started getting requests from customers, existing customers, and even new ones that we talked to for a cloud-hosted solution, a SaaS solution. So through this journey, there was a point where we, we kept getting requests. We, didn't, we tried to think about what to do, but there was a point where we needed to investigate this further, and that's the scope of this talk. It's shifting from the on-prem solution to the cloud, but then even more, 
it's all about this brownfield migration. So our cloud platform, we've had two versions. Octopus Cloud version one was our first steps into a cloud-hosted SaaS solution. And so we had feedback from our customers that they were, that they were asking for this, but we didn't know if there was broader customer, customer demand. And so we did the simplest thing we could do to take on-prem on VMs, that solution, a, a solution that ran on Windows VMs, and get it into the cloud. And so to do that, we built our first cloud platform, Octopus Cloud V1, on top of Windows EC, EC2 VMs, and we had hundreds of customers on that platform. And so with the core goal of validating that demand, it was successful. And so that, that, went, that was a, a wonderful um, first step. But then we had a bunch of pain points and a lot of learnings almost immediately we started work on Cloud V2. And the, through analysis from our team, we landed on shifting from EC2 to Kubernetes to be able to save, save money and a range of other benefits. And so this talk is focused all about moving from EC2 to Kubernetes, but since that time, we've evolved our platform and we keep maturing it. So, a lot of other lessons learned uh, beyond that. So just to give you a bit of an idea of the architecture of Octopus Cloud, um, there's four main components. So Octopus is, uh, like historically, it was a solution that ran all on a virtual machine. Um, and so it's been containerized. That's the core monolithic system. Has a collection of APIs and a front end, et cetera. But to make that run, we have a database um, we're primarily based off the Microsoft platform, so our database is a SQL Server. Now, we also have file storage, again, on-prem. That, uh, that was quite easy, but again, shifting to the cloud, we needed a solution for that as well. And then networking, typically in front uh, as part of a modern solution. So in July 2018, that was the point when we had been building a uh, cloud platform. We built the infra infrastructure to provision these VMs, be able to build customers, and be able to launch that. And again, I mentioned the core goal was to validate business demand that people would actually pay for this. And the good news is that was successful. On launch, we had hundreds of existing customers start migrating, and we had a lot of new customers, people trying us. So we, we successfully validated that goal. But then we hit some challenges. So building off of um, EC2, every single customer, again, this was sort of a, an MVP, but with a, a very specific goal. Every customer who signed up for a trial where they started paying for Octopus or, or not, it cost us $100 per month for the VM. Uh, uh, every customer had their own snapshot of infrastructure. So there was no cross, um, cross talk, et cetera. But what that meant was that our first few months uh, of AWS bills were eye-watering. And so the, the, the key lesson learned there is that yes, there is a business demand. This is valid, we can proceed. The bad news is it was very expensive. And so that was a problem that we had to solve. And so that was kind of the motivation for us to look for a better solution in which we landed on, a, um, on Kubernetes. So now we'll, we'll jump into the lessons learned. So the first one, and again, this is one of the commercial lessons learned and it, it's almost, um, a bit deceptive because whenever you move to a new technology, there's always benefits. You think that uh, you know you move to a new technology, it solves all these problems that you already have, but there's trade-offs. It's not typically black or white. So in our case, one of the core problems was that every customer had uh, their own virtual machine, their own database, and a range of infrastructure. But the challenge with that is most of those virtual machines sat idle most of the time. There was very low resource utilization. So if you think about a CI process, GitHub Actions, or another build process, 
they can be compute intensive. Like they're compiling code, they're writing, running tests, they're doing a range of things that actually are, are constantly using compute. Whereas deployments, you execute, you, you run commands, you wait, you execute something, you wait. So it's a lot less busy. And so when we had entire virtual machines, we wanted to provide a responsive experience, but it was expensive. And so we didn't have great density or utilization. And one of the other challenges with virtual machines is they're, they're in tiers. So if you could increase, like increase the compute, go up one tier, sometimes that can double the cost or increase it greatly. So we didn't have great dials to be able to tune that to save money. So we had to look for a better solution. And uh, the two main ones that we considered one was increased density on virtual machines. Do we want to build a layer to be able to have multiple customers on the same infrastructure, same virtual machine? But we ruled that out in terms of the need to build the infrastructure to manage that, manage that and scale that. And what happens if one customer's data overwrites the other and a, a range of things? So that, that didn't work for us. One of the op other options we considered was serverless. It's a great scalable technology, but for our system, for that point in time, it would have required a much larger investment to rewrite, re-architect our, our solution. So we ruled out both of those. And so Kubernetes was a very attractive option at that time. The, the two, when I think of Kubernetes, the two main benefits, it's scalability and resilience. There's a lot of dials. It's a very rich platform. But for us specifically, in terms of cost control, it would allow us to increase the density for, um, for the infrastructure, again, saving money, better control over incremental scaling, and then like the other benefits of Kubernetes, desired state, immutability, all the, all the other benefits of the modern platform. So costs were definitely a consideration for us. So we made the decision to containerize Octopus, containerize our solution, and start moving to uh, Kubernetes. Now, this was in 2018, and, it, and it's, it's interesting because we had to make a couple of decisions. Did, were we going to go Windows or Linux containers? And, and in 2024, it kind of seems crazy that we'd even say that. But we ended up picking Linux, and that, that was the right solution. You can see up there, we, we actually published a Windows container version of Octopus. And the classic problem at that time, it was still early, but yeah, it, it makes sense why um, we didn't go down that route. The other one is, do we self-host our Kubernetes clusters? Do we build, configure, manage those ourselves? Or do we use public clouds? And we already were using AWS. We were bought into the public clouds. And we, we decided to stick with that. We didn't want to manage that infrastructure. And we actually did an evaluation in terms of costs to see uh, which cloud was best and the range of technologies for our solution. And we ended up uh, shifting to the Azure platform. So the second lesson is that brownfield migrations take time. And so any, if you've been in IT for any period of time, Projects are always late. It always takes longer than you would expect. And for us, the scope of this project was migrating a native Windows Server application to a Linux container. So the, the scope of that, some of the mechanics were quite easy, but then there were gotchas that we didn't expect. So one of the first things, and one of the, the first things that we tackled was to containerize it, we had to port our application to .NET Core. That was the, the version that was cross-platform. And then update dependencies, do everything we needed to be able to uh, run on Linux and be containerized. We also had to eliminate a lot of the Windows-specific logic. And there was a lot of testing, because some, some of those mechanics weren't too bad. But it was testing all the uh, edge cases and ensuring that like file system changes were truly uh, platform independent. Post-migration, we, we actually hit a couple of interesting issues. Um, Octopus deploys a, a, um, a broad solution. It's very flexible. And so we had certain authentication providers that no longer worked. So because of that platform change, and we had a really challenging issue due to the fact that we were shifting moving our application uh, to Linux and running it at scale. So we actually hit a SQL 
uh, database client issue that we actually had to troubleshoot and work with Microsoft to resolve. One of the bigger challenges was that we were actually changing the underlying platform while we were still building new features all on top of it. So we were building the plane while we were flying it. And so while we're changing that underlying platform, we still had new features to be competitive in the market and things our customers were asking for. There were bug fixes, security patches. None of that could stop. And so migrating that, making sure everything went smoothly, and um, th that was a challenge and uh, some potential bugs through that period. And so if you look at some of the timelines, it actually took a fair bit of time. Um, so shortly after we launched Octopus Cloud, we started working on this. And then we didn't launch uh, Octopus Cloud V2 until July 2019. And we dog fooded that our Linux image for about a year before we started publishing it for our customers. So trying to ensure stability. Now, lesson three, it's, it's an interesting one. and so. When we were building this, it might not have been as clear of a solution because Kubernetes has matured a lot. But the, the key point here is that Kubernetes and containers, you don't have to use them for everything. So for those four major components that I was talking about, um, we chose to use cloud services instead of leveraging Kubernetes for them. So our database, we use Azure SQL. And then even for file storage, we're using a, uh, the Azure, Azure um, file stores for that as well. We didn't leverage uh, Kubernetes in that case. And the real, this is kind of a, a case of build versus buy or not invented here, where you're trying to think about what makes sense. And so by leveraging these uh, mature cloud services, they're already built. They have a strong focus and expertise and one of the the best examples like there there's deeper features that you can turn on with like a, a click or a configuration change the one one example here zonal geo redundant backup options with very little config the the cloud services they've matured to a point where they offer a lot of value rather than trying to build it yourself now lesson four is a, a very interesting one and so i think Something that we've learned building this platform is that uh, it's not just something you can kind of build and forget about. And operations work shouldn't, shouldn't be a part-time job. So we have uh, a few stats here. Um, we have almost 2,000 uh, cloud customers and a range of infrastructure. But maintaining the stability of that platform is uh, a key thing. There's companies around the world that depend on the platform as a critical part of their infrastructure for shipping, application, uh, new features, updates, bug fixes, all of the things that we, we uh, application teams do and need, and it needs to be stable. So we have a cloud platform team dedicated to the, towards that goal, keeping things stable. And I think over the years since, since we launched, it has stabilized, and nowadays, like it, it's uh, quite a stable solution for our customers. And so, a bit more detail on how how we achieve that. We have different architectural elements to help maintain that, but then we have processes as well to um, ensure stability. So Octopus adopted a cell-based architecture, and I'm, I'm kind of just giving a quick overview, but we actually did a webinar with the cloud team where they go into this in more depth and talk about how our cloud platform is built on top of Kubernetes. But we're, we're multi-region. Customers can use us in um, North America, Europe, or APAC. Um, but we have the concept of reefs, which is, is one of the, the cells where we group um, AKS clusters and other related resources for a group of customers. And for each region, we have multiple reefs grouping all this infrastructure. So if we do have an outage or if there's a problem, it can be isolated to a smaller set. And then we can address that and maintain stability in other regions or even in other reefs. And 
we have the ability to recreate them and migrate customers between them. So one of the processes that we, we have established, all of our clusters are ephemeral. So we, we have the ability um, to recreate them, test them, and then ensure they're stable before we start moving customers to them. And it, it's really useful in terms of um, uh, AKS, uh, Kubernetes upgrades, et cetera. And it also, our, our team also, one of the, the other keys they do is scaling resources because customers hold the product in different ways. Some have higher demands and lower, so we can move them around. And um, the external services also enable us to um, tweak or fine tune things. If one customer needs more resources, we can detect that and we can automatically scale them, add more DTUs, et cetera. So all towards the goal of maintaining a stable solution. So lesson five, now it's kind of interesting because so far I've been talking about a range of things that we, decisions we made to not have to write more code or uh, make large system changes. But one of the things that we did make a decision to do is to build a cloud portal, a one-stop shop for everything Octopus Cloud. And so the, the lesson here for us is that it's okay to build custom tooling for your business requirements. And so in this case, it's a one-stop shop where you can see the status of all instances, a range of metadata or observability summaries that we pull from them. And then we also uh, kind of related to one of the keynote talks this morning, we have day two operations tasks, things to maintain, upgrade, auto scale, database maintenance, backups, range of tasks that all is centralized from our cloud portal. And there's a range of other things, because it is a commercial solution, there's different things that we need to be able to support uh, and really make money off it. So um, be able to collect information for billing purposes and upgrade, maintain things. And even our, our customers have the ability to specify when we can do upgrades of our solution. Um, so it respects all of that. And the other key thing is that this enables us to stop noisy neighbors. So that example where one customer could have much higher requirements than another one, we have the ability to monitor them and then even move them so to avoid uh, impacts to other customers. So the final point here is, again, it, it's kind of maintaining the, the theme of uh, being thoughtful about what you build and what you don't build. So the final lesson is really to leverage third-party tooling, and again, both free or paid, where it makes sense for your, your team, where, whenever feasible. And so it's really a strategic build versus buy. And so we use a range of open source solution to uh, support our platform. A lot of the same tooling you would use um, for observability, et cetera. But in terms of uh, the core, one of the core parts of our solution to upgrade uh, customer instances, we actually use Octopus Deploy and our tenanted deployments feature to upgrade um, all of our customers. So we use Octopus to deploy Octopus. Um, and it, the benefit of that, again, using this tooling is to simplify your life and balance um, build versus buy. So just another snapshot of a, a range of the tools that we use to support our platform. Again, it's a mix of free and paid solution, but we have a lot of monitoring in place and you know, observ observability to be able to provide that stable platform. So monitor things, and when there are problems, respond to them, have the right people looped in, and be able to uh, support, support our customers. And so with that, just a, a quick summary of everything that I've talked about today. Um, the biggest one was that cost can be a driver to move to Kubernetes, which may be counterintuitive, but it, it really uh, made sense for us. Um, the other ones, a lot of it, again, it's all about that strategic, what do you actually write custom code for? Where can you leverage existing solutions? Um, and what should you pay for to, to make your life easier? Um, 
And those, those were kind of the, the key lessons from this migration. And so with that, that's it. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, again, feel free to, to scan the QR code uh, and add me on LinkedIn. But at this point, any, any questions? At the network level, uh, to, to make sure that not one customer takes all the bandwidth, or even if deploys not possible for you. For in terms of that, uh, I would actually, I'm not actually sure. Any of the team, no. I don't think we do. No. So it doesn't tell. I didn't think so. That was wasn't something that uh, I recalled. Cloud agnostic, so in, so in terms of picking which cloud to use, yeah. the key decision, like, so back when we made the decision, initially we went with AWS, and I think a lot of it was based on the team and the skills and expertise, but when we moved to Azure, the real driver was costs. And so looking at all those major components, breaking things down, and there was analysis based off Cloud V1, what the usage patterns were, and where it was gonna be cheaper. So really it was, that was the main driver and then we invested in the single platform. So we didn't, so Octopus can still be self-hosted. So if anybody wanted to stick with a certain cloud, they can always do that themselves. But for our cloud hosted solution, it was more picking one and then investing and maturing it. Yep, go ahead. So which technology we use for the scalability of the applications? That one I Yeah, it, not at this point, as far uh, as far as as far as I know. Yeah. Go ahead. How do you make it possible to do the kind of like general production customers? How do we make sorry? How do we make it possible to have what something in general uh, production customers? Um, for that one, what I would say is we have a. Uh, the webinar that I linked to, and there's a, a screenshot of, it goes into much better depth in how that's all designed and solved. Um, so yeah, that, at this point, I, <laughs> the team that uh, it actually built that uh, give, gives a clearer answer. So with that, we might wrap up. But uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining me. And uh, we'll go to the, to the next session.